let's go back. Not all the way back, just right here. Meet the ocean's hottest new freak, the Lancelet. He's long, he can sort of swim, and he's got this crazy thing in his back. The kids are calling it a spine. The kids are dumb though, it's not a spine. It is a notochord, which is like the Walmart version of a spine. Anyway, this freak swims around at the bottom of the ocean and digs himself into the sand sometimes, but that's about all he does. The kids love it though. But things are about to change. See, the Lancelet is tired of being just another invertebrate swimming around the seas of the Cambrian era. So he's gonna become something more, something beautiful, the first fish. The first bits of fish history are a bit blurry. It's like a drunken night out where you black out and forget half the night, except we're missing 12 million years of fish. But eventually we found them again, and now they look like this. Which resembles a tongue more than it resembles a modern fish, but baby steps, okay? For the next 50 million years or so, nature just sort of made a bunch of different iterations of this body plan. You've got Hyquichthys. Hyquichthys with a split caudal fin also known as Mylokunmingia, and Hyquichthys with a funny nose, also known as Zhangxianichthys. Fish really weren't that creative at the time. That was, at least, until the invention of plates. Not dinner plates, but armor plates. Really tough pieces of bone formed into medieval quality armor. But what happens when one guy in the village gets armor? Well, everyone else thinks, shit, I don't want to be the only one without armor. So they get armor too. But when everyone has armor, how does anyone eat anyone else? Well, thus begins the first notable arms race in fish history. Prey cover themselves in thicker and more abundant armor plating, while predators get stronger and stronger and sharper teeth inside of stronger and stronger jaws. Wait, back up. Jaws? Yeah, it's not really clear what came first, but at some point the fish went from these sucky sucky do nothing faces to being able to chomp. This is possible through the magic of the jaw. Basically some bones with a joint, so that the top and bottom of the mouth can meet in the middle. It sounds incredibly simple, but as you are watching this, you likely use your jaw for everyday tasks. So, thank whatever ancient fish came up with that. At this point, the jawed fish and non-jawed fish, known as nathostomes and anathostomes respectively, are pretty genetically separate. But it turns out the whole jaw thing was a really good idea, because they're going to dominate the oceans for the rest of history while the Anatha are only left with a couple representatives, holding on for dear life into the modern age. You may recognize the most notable of them, lampreys and hagfish. Other than these guys though, the age of not having a jaw was over, and now the biters came in to usher in a new age of fishy goodness. The most popular of the biters who existed in what I'm calling the Age of Armor was the Dunkleosteus, who you probably recognize from some crappy YouTube video about how some guy saw one while diving. But the Dunkleosteus is far from the only armored fish, and I'd venture to say nowhere even near the coolest armored fish. To name a few, you've got Bothriolepis canadensis, which looks like an air pod that got run over, and had some crazy face bone that apparently the science hippies wrote a lot of papers about, called a preorbital recess. The Tictodontida, which look like modern day chimeras, but are in fact not related basically at all and actually had the first fish instances of sexual dimorphism, which is when the male and female of a species look different. In this case, some males had hooks on their fins to assist in the mating process. And my personal favorite, the Acanthotheraceae, which combined the idea of being cool, armored, ocean super predators with the idea of being a literal tadpole. Around the same time as armored super predators were roaming the oceans, this fancy new way of being a fish was developing. Remember those hundreds of millions of years all about bones? We put bones in the teeth. We put bones in the back. We put bones on the bones. Well, yeah, that was still the mainstream. But a few hippies said, hey, what if we got rid of those bones and instead made ourselves out of cartilage? Although a niche idea, this, spoiler, turned out to be a pretty successful concept, with all of the modern sharks, rays, skates, chimeras, and more following this same lineage and philosophy. They didn't start out looking how they do now, though. In fact, the first elasmobranchs resembled modern-day frilled sharks, called Phoebidus. They got actually quite big, around 4 feet, and served a similar ecological role as sharks still do in the modern day. They got quite diverse for a while too, with some fun representatives who wouldn't make it to the modern day, such as the well-known Megalodon, or some weird eel shark things called Xenocanths. 
Eventually though, the groups of sharks and rays that we know into the modern day would emerge and burst in diversity. Interestingly, xenocants also made quite a name for themselves in freshwater, with many species being found there, which is really uncommon for cartilaginous fishes if you think about it today. By this point, fish had already started creating ancient versions of the things we know and love today. The Tiktaalik had started transitioning to land to create modern mammals, Labyrinthodonts had done the same to create amphibians, then later created reptiles as well. But that didn't stop fish from continuing to do weird stuff and evolve into the crazy niches we have today. In fact, creating all of the modern animal groups that we think of was just a fun little side project in the history book of fishes. Prior to the takeover of bony fishes, a few groups such as the spiny sharks or ocanthidae held dominance in the oceans. These guys are incredibly interesting, as they were ancestral to the cartilaginous fishes, but shared many features with the bony fishes, acting as sort of a centrist fish in the growing two-party fish political system. These guys went extinct about 250 million years ago though, as it turns out being a bony fish was better than trying to do everything at once. From here, the theme was niches. If there was water to be inhabited on this earth, there was a fish who would figure out how to do it. It's worth mentioning that most of the large groups of fish were already in existence by now, such as the Sarcoterygians, who live onto the modern day only through a select few fish, but at the time were quite abundant. However, no groups of fishes, not the lobe-finned, nor the cartilaginous, could stand up to the mighty, bony, ray-finned fishes, who would spend the rest of history in absolute dominance of basically every colonizable ecosystem out there. Almost every recognizable fish in the modern age is a representative of this group. What you eat, what's living in your local streams, what you fish for. We often think of our place in the timeline as being final, but in reality, we are just witness to one tiny bit of evolution's grand design. And right now is the era of the bony fishes. Some of my favorite extinct bony fishes are the Gildaecthidae, who have some species preserved in pretty complete fossils and show some very odd characteristics from ancient fishery, such as bite force in the back of the mouth as well as modern features such as well-jointed and spaced fin rays. The Cerichthiforms, which has got to be the most ridiculous looking elongate fish, which is quite an award considering worm eels exist. These guys were well preserved in fossils and had a ton of species found. The Semionotiforms, which had beautiful sail fins, sort of like a dimetrodon, and had no scales surrounding this fin so that it had maximum free range of movement. They were likely some of the most precise swimmers that the world of fish has ever seen. And the Salfatiforms, which similarly have a giant sailfin, but were very common right along the coast here in the USA, and some even survived until 66 million years ago, which in terms of fishery is really not that long ago. And with that, we arrive at the modern day. Not all modern fish arose at the same time, with some single species dating back hundreds of millions of years and some likely only coming into fruition within the last few hundred years. A great example of this recent diversity are darters. Darters are a North American subfamily of fishes that come in every color combination you can imagine and are extremely diverse in the United States. Their evolution was only made possible by the retreating of massive glaciers which covered the continent. Essentially, ancestors of darters, shiners, and other diverse groups of North American fish lived together far south in North America, where there was open water, and as the glaciers retreated and the world warmed, they radiated across the country, creating species complexes that we're still figuring out today. On the other hand, some species of sturgeon have been around for nearly 100 million years. Don't let the media trick you though, these fish are not basically unchanged. Evolution has come for them just like it comes for everything, and although their rate of evolution may be slow, because their adaptation has been pretty successful, the sturgeon we see in our waters nowadays are not unchanged from those millions of years ago. You know who is unchanged though? Gar. A paper recently came out about how slow their rate of genetic mutation is, and how good they are at repairing anomalies. The result is that despite being absolutely ancient species, they genuinely haven't changed much, shown by the fact that even species which have been isolated for millions of years can still have fertile offspring. And in the modern day, we have incredible fish diversity, with basically every waterway in the world having some fish living in it, from extreme deep oceans to tiny pools in a 110 degree Fahrenheit desert. And yet, it's crazy to think that before the 35,000 species of fish we have today came hundreds of thousands more species that we will never get to see in action.